Good morning, Thailand and the United States and the world, really. Because YouTube's all about the world, right? Um, shirtless again, but you know, I'm gonna spin it because everything these days is about spin, right? You can't just give somebody information, you gotta put your spin on it. So I am shirtless, not because it's warm and Thailand, 90 something degrees during the day most of the time when I do these videos. I am shirtless because I am uh, making uh, a statement for uh, awareness of a very important cause. Free the nipple. Not free. There, oh, there's a nipple. Nice little round pink nipple. Hairy nipple. Sorry. It is what it is. But the free the nipple. That's, a, that's a, something we can all get behind, right? And... Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm being goofy. I'm being a silly asshole again. You know, this is my, my want. Um, but the free the nipple movement was, was, is, I don't know if it's even still going on. That You know, we're too busy watching looters and rioters, right? Because that's more interesting. Um, some women, I know it's been New York City. It really was a, was a thing for a while. Some women were walking around topless. Um, especially in the summer when it's hot because <laughs> like me they didn't see why they had to wear bras and shirts and t-shirts and tops and <laughs> you know why did they have to layer when it's friggin 95 degrees out good point <laughs> I actually had zero problem with it and of course there's so many hung up people you know that just have issues <laughs> And they were freaking out, you know, cover that up. Uh, oh my God, we can't see breasts. Huh? Grow the fuck up, you know. It's, it's breasts, it's tits, it's it's no big deal, you know. Honestly, and if you go to Europe, once again, travel. <laughs> Seems to be a theme here. It keeps coming around in circles. The more you travel, the more educated you are, and the more you know in Europe, there's lots of beaches that are topless. Um, it's no big deal, you know. They don't. Uh, the occurrences of rape aren't up or any there's no there's no downside to women being able to take their shirt off if they want once again don't, don't get me wrong i'm not demanding you all strip down and show the goodies it's it's if you want to take it take your shirt off like we get to do guys right it's fair it makes sense if you want to do it, you should have the right to do it, and you shouldn't be arrested for taking your freaking shirt off in public. If you're not comfortable, if you're shy, or, you know, you're like a Thai woman who, you know, my girl gets out of the shower with a towel on and puts her bra on over the towel. I mean, maybe your grandmother did that, but, you know, yeah, she, she's 44, you know. Well, she's a grandmother, but still, I mean... Thai women are super, super modest, and they will never, ever, ever go topless in public, I guarantee you. Um, and that's a whole interesting story, too. If you get into the past, hundreds of years ago, uh, Southeast Asian women were like um, island women and women on the African continent, and they did go topless most of the time. They just wore like a sarong thing, if, if anything. Um, and then they westernized. They modernized and westernized uh, King Rama V from the, the King and I or uh, Anna and Siam, the King of Siam or, you know, in the movie the, with Jodie Foster. <clears throat> um, when they westernized, which it was a good thing. It really was a good thing that Th Thailand westernized. And what I mean by that was they were able to stay independent. They never got taken over by China. They never got taken over by England or Spain or Portugal or the U.S. They're an independent state. The price of that independence was opening up to Western uh, and getting the money, right? So, fair trade. Uh, I think it's the best uh, Southeast Asian country. Uh, Japan has a lot going for it, but it's very expensive. Um, so, if you're an expat, right, if you're retired, uh, Thailand's a better deal because it's a great country, okay, maybe not as great as Japan in, in a lot of things, but it's much cheaper, it's, it's more affordable, it's an affordable Japan, how about that, for Thailand. So, um, and, and I mentioned in another video, Vietnam, Vietnam is coming up now, because they've been watching Thailand saying, hey, hey, we want, our king wants to be worth $40 billion too, you know, like, maybe that's a good idea. So they're a lot less restrictions in Vietnam, uh, and things are cheap. 
foreigners can own land. There's, you know, they're they're welcoming. They're trying to get the foreigners to come. Uh, Costa Rica, of course, is another one, not in Southeast Asia, but another country that's um, actively trying to get expats to come and live there, and then doing it pretty successfully. Um, so the whole free the nipple thing, like I said, yeah, I mean, just common sense, guys. A nipple's not that big a deal. It's not the end of the world if you see one. I mean, what are you, in fifth grade? You know, you see a, a woman's breast and you, you freak out? What the hell's wrong with you? Like, I mean, it, you know, I get that we're a sex-obsessed society. You know, um, I saw a meme once that said, you know, uh, how long it took Facebook to get a million users. And it was like, I don't know, two years or something. And then Twitter and Instagram and all the different social media platforms took some period of time to get a million users or followers or whatever. And then it showed um, Pornhub. Pornhub. <laughs> one, one day <laughs> to get a million users. <laughs> We're the America's sex obsessed, man. They just, they, they love their porn guys, especially love their porn. So, um, yeah, the whole free the nipple thing, it's it's ridiculous. Women should be able to do what they want. It's their friggin' bodies. They should be able to walk around without men pawing at them or ogling them or whatever. When it's hot, dude, a shirt sucks. And a shirt and a bra, I mean, you're just putting layers on. Fuck. It's bullshit. Anyway, it is what it is. So, we're going on from free the nipple, near and dear to my heart, to um, racism. Um... Nobody, well, I won't say nobody will talk about it, but very few people will talk about it because the fear is if you're a white person and you talk about racism, you're a racist, which common sense and most of my friends left and right have common sense, a lot of common sense, more than most people. That's why they're my friends. Um, they understand that nothing can get fixed and it is broken i mean if you don't think it's broken <laughs> to sound cliche right now because this is all over social media you're part of the problem right be careful how you use that but if you're not willing to admit there's a problem you know like alcoholism that's part of the problem and if you're not willing to discuss it and and get information get facts, educate yourself, and then, you've heard me say this before too, about business, about everything, this is the way life works, guys. You make an educated decision. So how do you make an educated decision about race, about business, about relationships, about anything? You gather information. You get information as much as you can from as many different sources as you can, understanding some of those sources are gonna be biased, right? Uh, so you get as much pure information as you can find. You take the spin information and consider the source and say, well, that's information, but it's being spun, but it's still information, so I'll take it in. doesn't mean I'm, I'm going to put it into my heart. It just means I'll consider it. On the, it's on this list of paper I'm compiling. You know, I'm doing a college paper <laughs> on this subject, and I, I want to collect information as much as I can. So... Having a discussion about racism is super important. Now, I've been thinking about this for a while, right? So it's May, uh, June, Jesus, June, hey, Thailand guys. I'm, <laughs> remember, I came here to retire, so Corona happened. I'm working on getting this place profitable again. Um, but I'm supposed to be sitting in a hammock drinking mango drinks, okay? So June 7th. June 6th, something like that. Uh, but I've been thinking about the, the racism problem, obviously, with all the, the rioting and everything going on in the country and the big divide in the media, stoking the fires because they're the media, right? That's what they do uh, for a while. So why, why did I wait until today to do a video? Well, because I like to provide a solution anytime I address a problem. So... My biggest issue with the media, and this has been for several years now, not just now, is they're quick to say, um, you know, that's wrong. You know, they, they sit up on their pulpit and spin it to their particular left or right. You know, Fox will criticize Obama. 
CNN will criticize Trump, whatever, whatever their little spin is, they'll they'll sit there on their pedestal, on their up on their high platform and say that's wrong. Okay, what are you going to do about it? You, you who's reporting it, what are you going to do about it? Oh, absolutely fucking nothing. I'm just going to talk, 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 <laughs> and get paid and look good and have my hair done and put makeup on. You fucking piece of shit. You worthless fucking piece of crap. Humanity doesn't need you. We don't need to tune in and watch you with your makeup and your hair telling us what's right and wrong. Fuck you. Fuck you. We know what's right and wrong. We have a brain. We have a heart. We don't need to tell you. We don't need you to tell us what's right and what's wrong. And, okay, so something's wrong. Just say we agree what they're saying is wrong. What's the solution? How do you fix it? How are you going to talk to me for an hour and tell me this is a problem, that's a problem, this is a problem, that's a problem. But you don't tell me how to fix any of it. You don't give me any solutions. You just say this sucks, that sucks, I hate that, I hate that, I hate him, I hate her. Okay, how do you fix it? I just, I just look pretty and read from a prompter. That's exactly right. That's why you're a worthless fucking piece of shit. Everybody who works in the media on both sides. You do your spin. You sell your fucking brand of politics or religion or whatever the fuck you're selling. But that's all you're doing is selling. You're not educating. You're not giving people options. You're not giving people a choice. So, the reason I haven't done a video is because I wanted to think about it and say, this is a problem. How do we fix it? And for those who are extreme left... <laughs> You know, I mean, left, 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 communist, socialist, left. They're going to be very surprised at this answer. But if you listen to it, and if you just watch the whole video and listen to it, and you have a half a brain, which is a big assumption because a lot of people don't even have a half a brain these days. Uh, if your IQ is over 100, it will make sense. So let me shock you first and make you say, no, 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 no. He's a racist. He's an idiot. He's that money. Money is the solution to the problem of racism. So I like that a certain percentage of people who just saw that immediately tuned me out, turned me off, clicked off the video because they're convinced that money's evil. They're con they associate money with conservatives. That's why I said the far left. I'm not picking on anybody. What I'm saying is, you know, triggered. Have you seen the memes all over social media? Triggered. Oh, the girl with the giant eyes and shit, right? With the, the veins sticking out in her neck. She got triggered. Why? Because somebody put up a dissenting viewpoint and she wouldn't shut the fuck up and stay calm and listen to what the other side's saying. You can reject what they say after you get the information, but you're not getting any information when you're triggered. So when I said money, a lot of people just shut it down, lean back, cross their arms, because they don't want to hear. No, money. You're, you're a Trumpster. You're, you're right wing. You're conservative. You're this. You're that. They want to put a label on me. Fuck you. You don't get the right to label me. You don't know me. There's, like every other person, there's many sides to me. There's a lot going on up here. I am not a this. I am not a that. Okay? Don't fucking label me because it's convenient for you and you hate a group and you want to shove me into a group. You want to know if I'm a good guy or a bad guy. So, boom, the minute I said money, you're a conservative. And if you're far left, conservative is a bad guy. You're alt-right. You're this. You're that. Fuck you. You do not get to judge me. You don't know me. You do not know me, and you do not get to judge me. You don't get to judge anybody except yourself. Oh, but you don't want to do that. <laughs> You're never going to sit and look in the mirror and see if you like what, you, what looks back, are you? No, you fucking hypocrite. So let me explain. For those of you who are still watching, because... You're not triggered. You're not far left or far right. You're, you're a moderate human being who considers all sides of an issue, every issue, not just the ones that don't touch a raw nerve in you. Politics and religion. You want to push people's buttons? Talk about politics, religion, or race, right? Those are hot button topics that people get emotional about, and they're not, they won't think, they won't reason because they're emotional. Take the emotions out of it and just look at it logically. So, what I mean my money solves the race problem. Uh, I posted on Fuckbook, Mr. Zuckerberg's little toy, um, 
Uh, in response to uh, Donna Bartell, she's uh, one of my friends, investor in Jacksonville. She's a roofer, trying to be an investor, um, getting into it. And she posted, you know, what what the hell's up with this racism stuff? Like, why do whites hate blacks and blacks hate white, whites? You know, why why are we having this crap in the streets? Why is the country being torn up? And there's posts about. Uh, Antifa, a left-wing organization, inciting the riots. Uh, and there's posts about, uh, what the fuck are their names now? I, I never even heard of these guys. One of my buddies posted it. So I do get information off a of fuck book. That's why I'm so pissed that it's, you know, censoring posts and have fact bot checks and all that crap. Fact check bots. Um, Bo- Boogaloo Boys is the right wing, right? So the left is claiming that extreme right wing fascists are bringing the bricks to the party and Molotov cocktails and pipe bombs and shit. And the right is claiming the left is doing an Antifa, right? Funded by Soros, the, the guy who takes over governments, and, and, you know, including Thailand. He did it here back in the uh, late 90s, early 2000s. So um, everybody's pointing fingers and oh it's them and it's them and it's them meanwhile we don't we don't know we really don't know who put that somebody fucking put bricks there pallets of bricks all over the country who did it who knows but that only sought to make it worse right the underlying problem was there are protests going on for them to exploit you can't have a riot if you don't have a protest you can't have a protest unless something's fucked up something's fucked up guys you know, they're racist so and, and the looting People are going and breaking into, and this doesn't make it right. It's wrong to steal. You know that. I know that. They know that. But the reason that a lot of poor people steal, I didn't say black people. Nice try. Nice fucking try. Yeah, make me a racist. Once again, put me in a little box where it's easy to explain and understand. Fuck you. Shame on you. Shame on you. I said poor people. And that's important. I didn't say black people. And I didn't say it to be politically correct. I said it for a reason. The people looting are looting because they don't have shit. They want a fucking big-ass TV like I got, right? I bought a TV here in Thailand uh, with the Android so I can watch American shows. And it was 7000 baht, like $200. Well, I could afford to spend $200 on a fucking TV. They can't. They can't afford to. They want the big screen TV just like you do. But they don't have it. Now, okay, here's your, you know, Midwestern white guy, right, from <laughs> going to go out and work. Well, yeah, that's true. I work my ass off to be able to get the money to do that. That's absolutely true. And to a certain extent, everybody in this country can go and work and get what they want. That's the system. But if you educate yourself, you will see there are, there, there are certain handicaps for the poor people and the reason that they're poor right they don't have the same access to the tools that we have right once again educate yourself don't yell at me and argue with me i'm racist on this on that educate yourself get the same information that i've gotten it's out there and you'll see how the lack of access to tools specifically tools on how to make money uh, the opportunity is there, but the education and the tools have not been taught to the poorer people. So they're looting simply because they want what everybody wants. And they think the only way to get it is break into a store and take this shit. You want a TV? <laughs> Wait until there's a protest, throw a brick and break into the friggin' Target and take a TV. Or Walmart or wherever they, they stole TVs from. Right? right. So... I answered getting back to Donna's post. Um, this is what kind of started me too. I'm thinking about this stuff. When I was in the military, uh, 1984 to 87, I was in a group of guys, a unit, a smaller unit, not just like a big, you know, platoon, right? Like a giant. Um, actually, I'm sorry, it's like a platoon. I was not like a company or a regiment. You know, I wasn't a part of a thousand guys. I was part of like 20 guys, right? And everybody in that unit, white, black, Asian, Hispanic, we were all the unit. Like, we were all together in that group. 
and nobody hated anybody because of their skin color, their religion, their politics. We never even talked about politics. Um, we were all in the same group that banded us together. We were brothers. We were absolutely brothers, black, white, Hispanic, Asian. It didn't matter. We were colorblind. We were tight. We were a unit, us against the world, us against everybody else. Now, we hated Marines, right? <laughs> Little rivalry, Ford versus Chevy, right? But it, it was we didn't hate black Marines or Chevy. We hated all jarheads, right? And they hated us, and it was like a little, you know. But we'd fight together, right? If there was a war, Marines and, and, and my unit would fight together, you know, side by side. So um, that was one example. When I played sports on a football team, black and white, we were, you know, the wide receiver was black, right? And the big, fat, stupid lineman or, or flanker, tight end, was, Video. was white. Video, baby. Video, you're a star. Video made the radio star. Where are you, baby? I can't even. Oh, you're squatting. You got to tell me one day why, why Asian squat. I don't get it. Asian squat. Is that racist to say Asian squat? I don't know why they squat, but they 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 make great catchers in the major leagues. They yeah, just think squat, no problem. If I squat, I wouldn't be able to stand back up. That probably has to do with being fat more than being white, but whatever. So um, we were tight. The football team was tight and black and white. You know, remember the Titans, Denzel, all that. I mean, it's unifying, right? Being part of a team. A military team or a football team is unifying. Uh, let's talk about um, status. Like uh, back in Jersey, yeah, Jersey, um, I was a car guy. And one of my buddies was going to law school in NYU, and he had a 78 Camaro um, with a 302, Chevy 302. A lot of guys don't remember that motor. Not a, not a Ford, but a Chevy. Um, it, it, it wound up to like uh, 10,000 RPM. You know, that's where it made its power, from 6,000 to 10,000 RPM. And a uh, shit brown, <laughs> I used to give him a lot of crap about that shit brown uh, 78 Camaro that he back aft and put the big ass tires on. We were car guys, right? I was poor. The mechanic who'd work on the car, the guy named Steve, he was poor. And Joe had money. His, his family lived in a better part of New Jersey, a nice rich uh, suburb and uh, he was going to law school at NYU and uh, you know, back half in a car and that motor you know, he put a lot of money into that car meanwhile I had a 66 Nova <laughs> that was spray painted <laughs> um, red metallic that's what I could afford, I was poor my mom was a school teacher, she made 9,000 bucks a year and she had two kids, you know, divorced. So it was what it was. I had no money. Steve had no money, but he was really good at working on cars. And Joe had money. But we were all friends. It didn't. It didn't matter that Joe was rich and we were poor. We were all buddies because we got together with the cars. And you know, later on in, in Florida, when I got married and moved to um, Fort Lauderdale, I had a, a Chevy Impala SS, and now. I had money, so I put a 396 Stroker in it, and I was part of the Impala Club. And in that club, there was rich guys, there was white guys, there was black guys, there was Hispanic guys. It, it didn't matter. We were all into cars, so we we bonded, and the color didn't matter. So I said in the in the post in to, in response to Donna about racism, it's really interesting to me that every time I've been a part of a tight knit family or group. Race didn't matter. So why is it that we, as a country, we're all Americans, how is it that all this hate exists? I guess the simple answer is the bigger the group gets, you know, the more diverse it gets, and there's more, there's some individuals who are going to be haters, and there's some individuals who, just, you know, whatever problem. In every family, if you think about a family, when you get extended family, you get the crazy uncle or the, you know, whatever, how many families have a guy who went to jail? You know, how many families have drug addicts? How many families, you know, there's there's black sheep, there's bad people in, in every family in America just about. So as the unit gets bigger, you know, 
I, it, it falls apart. That little tightness falls apart. So it was very interesting to me how that, that unit worked. So what can we do to fix America since it's broken, since we do have that hate, since we do have the people who won't put being an American first and being a white person or a Hispanic person or an Asian or a black person second. They refuse. They want to put their race first. They want to put people, you know, like, or they want to hate other races first over being an American. They look at a black guy and say, he's a black guy instead of saying he's an American, right, first, because he's part of the group, right? He should be part of us, right? Everybody, Americans, everybody, Asians, everything. Um, my brokerage, right? I own a real estate brokerage, a business, and we have 44 agents now. And if I go down the list, and, and, and here's what's important, I've never done this before. I never thought of my agents as who's black, who's Hispanic, and who's Asian. But in doing this thing, now I'm looking at it from that perspective, right? I'm going to step into a racist shoes and look and say, okay, which of my agents are black, or how many are black, how many are white, how many are Hispanic, how many are Asian? And in my little small group of 44, I mean, there's there's bigger firms, way bigger firms with, you know, one national chain in Jacksonville has 140 agents or had in just one office. You know what I mean? So I've got 40 in my whole company. But even in my little company, we have uh, an Asian woman, which is uh, O. Williams. She, she's from Thailand, and she's the one who got me investigating Thailand that's why I'm here right because of one of my agents I learned about Thailand and I chose that over Italy which was my initial uh, country I was going to retire in so there's an Asian out of 44 I've, I've got an Asian lady and then Kirk Williams another one of my agents is married to Jean Williams an investor from Thailand right from uh, Taiwan sorry Taiwan for Jean Thailand for O right uh, Miguel Miguel Ojeda uh, junior, who's an investor, uh, obviously he's Hispanic, and um, I used to have Santa Heredia from the Dominican Republic, but uh, she changed brokers when I left. I miss you, Santa. Uh, so, um, then, and I'm not going to go down and list every single person black and white, but yeah, there, there are blacks uh, and whites, <laughs> obviously, uh, in, in the brokerage, and until this day, I promise you, I never once thought about, oh, he's a black agent or she's a white agent. They were just agents. They were just part of the One Realty Corp family. Um, so there's another example of that unit I was talking about. You know what I mean? It's we're integrated, but we weren't forced to be integrated. It just happened organically. And so getting back to the the money thing. Everybody in One Realty Corp wants to A, help people. That is our mission to help people, specifically with buying and selling real estate. And of course they wanna they wanna feed their families and they, they you know they wanna they wanna be able to pay their bills. <laughs> so what they've learned because I've taught them is if you help people, the money will come. If you focus on money a lot of times money is elusive and it's hard to get, but if you focus on helping people, then the money comes in droves more than you ever imagined. So that's the common goal. So to fix America, if we, we being the people who have money, not white people, but people who have money, um, seek to educate and empower People who don't have money, not black people. Listen to what I'm fucking saying, please. If people with money, Bill Gates, <coughs> Bezos, <coughs> educate people who don't have money, when they get money, they're not going to be rioting and looting because now they've got money. That TV that they want, and who, do, who doesn't want a big ass TV or a new car? or a decent place to live, uh, food for their children. <laughs> you gotta survive before you can thrive, guys. So I always tell my agents, 
go out, do this, do this, do that, because you need to survive. If you can't pay your bills, you can't help people, right? Survive first, pay your electric bill, pay your gas bill, your insurance bill, pay your cell phone bill so you can do your job, and put food on your family's table. Even if it's an old, ugly table, you got to put food on the table. So survive first. And people need help doing that. People need help surviving. But once they survive, then they can thrive. And that's what we need to do. We need to educate people specifically about money and how to make money. Because money, when it's lacking, creates problems. So that's very important, too, that you, you don't think... Which a misconception is, if you have money, all your problems are solved. That's, that's definitely not true. Money isn't everything. Having a bunch of money in the bank doesn't solve your problems. But if you don't have money, a lack of money absolutely creates problems. Like being hungry, not being able to feed your kids, right? Um, that's a problem. That's a huge freaking problem. And it stresses you out, and you don't think straight. So very important that um, your basic needs are met first, everybody's basic needs. I think that goes a long way between, in fixing the problem. If everybody has, is trained and has the opportunity to make money in real estate, in the stock market, um, there's so many ways to make money in America. That's why it was the greatest country in the world and can be again. But we've got to help the people who are down below us economically and lift them up and bring them up equal to us. That's the responsibility of everybody who is more than comfortable. You know, and that starts with people like me who are admittedly middle class. I'm not a wealthy guy, but I'm doing better than the people who are riding and looting. So I need to put more content out there. I, my little part when I was in Jacksonville was... I did a um, seminar, it's like a, a meeting, a monthly meeting, uh, took over from a lady, Deb, who was giving from her heart um, to educate people in real estate and how to make money flipping houses. I made money flipping houses and I gave back. More of that, right? More of that. Kyle Paskowitz, who has over a thousand rentals, so you know he's in a higher echelon than I am money-wise. Uh, he started Yellowbird and paid for the venue for 200 and then 250 and then 300 investors to get together and network before corona that's what i'm talking about that's using your money to help everybody was there was there was people of all color people of all religion people of all sizes genders <laughs> those 300 people was a was a cross section of jacksonville all there to learn how to make money Right, or make more money, right? So it brought everybody together, and it was an opportunity for people to lift themselves up. Real estate's a great vehicle. It's not the only vehicle, but it's a great vehicle to take people and get them out of their the, the, the bottom of the social status, which is the economic status, right? So more, more of that, more teaching, more training, more helping people who don't have as much money as you, I see that as a huge boost. Um, is there going to be racism on both sides uh, after that? After we accomplish our goal of educating everybody, are some people going to reject it and just not want to do it? Sure, sure. There's no, there's no pill you can take to lose 100 pounds. You got to drink juice every day and exercise, right? Um, so no, that doesn't cure it, but it. It severely lessens it. If you provide the opportunity to become financially independent to anybody who wants it, I, I think that solves a big part of the problem. Um, my, my buddy Frank, who used to drum in Afterburner, um, he uh, posted an article about a promise that the uh, government made uh, to black voters back in the 60s in Jacksonville, which is if we brought everybody together, not just the Jacksonville downtown, but the whole surrounding areas, which have grown to be huge, right? Julington Creek and, and Oak Leaf and the beaches and Nocatee. I mean, there's this huge, you know, all the money is in the outlying areas from around downtown and downtown is a shithole. <clears throat> and it was kind of sort of like that back in the 60s. 
And the promise was, bring all these people in, we'll get the tax revenues up, the money, they'll bring money in, like Thailand brought the Western money in back in the 1800s. Um, let's bring in this the suburban money, and that will give us money to improve the city. Well, here's what happened. Anybody who lives in Jacksonville knows that money never went to downtown. Downtown's a shithole, right? 08, 09. And... Um, you know, I, I don't have all the answers. I'm not perfect. So when I was teaching real estate for two years to people, I would say, don't invest in real estate where you don't want to live. In other words, uh, avoid the ozone, 08, 09, 04, 06. That's our downtown area. That's where all the crime is. So was I being racist? Yes and no. No in the sense that I wasn't saying don't live or invest where black people live. I was saying don't invest in a war zone because nobody wants to live there and the people who do want to live there don't give a shit and they're you know not going to pay rent and they, it was a purely economic reason I gave advice but I was racist in the sense that I didn't look at why why is 08 and 09 a shithole and until I read that article this morning that Frank posted on Facebook I didn't realize it was because that the downtown people were lied to back in the 60s and, more importantly, subsequently by every city government after that. They never reinvested the profits they got from Nocatee and the plantation and Mandarin and, you know, Southside, all the wealthy suburbs, see, in Fort Caroline even, right? That money never went back down into, into the O's, the ozone, they called it. So um, that's fucked up. <laughs> I mean, and, you know, we can't dig up those, those uh, old crackers. <laughs> there you go. There's a racist term for you. Cracker, cracker, you damn saltine, you. Uh, we can't get those guys who were clearly prejudiced, you know, back in the 60s who were running shit, but we can fix it now, right? The, today's Jacksonville government can take some of that money they're getting from the, uh, the suburbs, the richer suburbs, the larger tax base, where homes are worth more money. Once again, not a black-white thing, right? It's the homes in Mandarin are worth more money. So because they're assessed at a higher tax value, they produce more revenue for the city in the way taxes. Taxes, property taxes, work based on assessed value. So you've got this belt, this circle surrounding downtown that brings in this huge amount of money. Pressure needs to be put on the city by every single Jacksonville resident, regardless of color or regardless of money, to invest a big hunk of that money into the downtown area. And if you're a selfish person, if you don't want to do what's right for the world, if you don't want to be a citizen of the world or, or our country at least, America, make America better, make Jacksonville better, if you don't want to do that, be selfish and just say, okay, do I really not want to use downtown at all? I mean, nobody went to the landing because it was downtown. There's no parking. It's, 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 a, it's a shithole, right? Wouldn't it be nice to have a nice downtown? I mean, just if you want to be selfish, if you want to be a jerk off and not not participate and be a citizen of the world, okay, no problem. To be selfish and just say, how cool would it be to have a nice, safe, clean downtown? Pour money into it. And the bottom line is the people, the residents who do live in 08 and 09, because they can't afford any place else.